Okay, so um, I think it, this is a perfect first session to follow um, Ms. Schnabel's very interesting remarks. And um, so hopefully we can kind of digest some of what we just heard also in this session as well. So let me just open then by introducing Giovanni Niccolo. Uh, Giovanni is an economist at the Federal Reserve Board. Um, and I understand as well, he was also at the ECB for some months. So I'd like to welcome him back and thank him for, for being here today. So as you can see, Giovanni will be presenting on inflation and real activity over the business cycle. And this is joint work with Francesco Bianchi and Dongo Song at Johns Hopkins University. So once uh, Giovanni is ready, he has 25 minutes. Uh, thank you for, also on behalf of my authors, thank you for uh, to the organizers for including uh, our paper into the program. Uh, this is today we'll present joint work with Francesco Bianchi at Johns Hopkins University and Dongo Song at the Carrier Business School of Johns Hopkins. Uh, I'm Giovanni Nicolò and work at the Federal Reserve Board, so the usual disclaimer applies. So prior to the recent inflation surge, uh, there has been a recent revamp of theories seeking to explain business cycle fluctuations in the U.S. over the entire post-World War II period. On the one hand, some theories uh, have been arguing that real activity and inflation are disconnected. These papers point to the main drivers of business cycle fluctuations as shocks that look like demand shocks, but uh, importantly, have no inflationary effects. Are the theories instead completely abstract from uh, the implications for inflation of their business cycle theories? And an important empirical foundation uh, of these theories has been offered recently by Angeleto, Scolare, and Dallas in a recent AER paper. And in their work, uh, the authors look at the US data for the entire post-World War II data and find that business cycle fluctuations are mainly driven by a main business cycle shock that uh, drives uh, real activity, but is disconnected from uh, movements in, in inflation. So what we do in this paper is to provide an empirical study on the nexus between real activity and inflation uh, at uh, business cycle frequencies for the U.S. post-World War II period. What we argue is that we uh, need to explicitly account for uh, movements in inflation and real activity at frequencies other than uh, the business cycle. In particular, we provide a framework that helps reconcile differences between our results and those in previous studies that point to indeed a disconnect between real activity and inflation over uh, the business cycle. So in our paper, we adopt two empirical approaches. The first one is uh, based on a simple uh, motivating uh, analysis. In particular, we adopt like a, a bandpass filter on US data and on measures of both real activity and inflation, we extract business cycle measures and provide motivating evidence of a relationship at business cycle frequencies between real activity and inflation. Motivated by this uh, simple evidence, we then adopt a more rigorous approach that consists of three steps. The first one, uh, the first step consists of estimating a trend cycle VR model on uh, macro and expectations data. This framework has been pioneered by Stock and Watson and has been more recently adopted by Del Negro and Coulters, as well as Johansson and Mertens and Ascari and Fosso, among many others. The second step consists of uh, applying a max share identification uh, strategy to the latent cycles. This approach has been pioneered by uh, Ulig and has been recently adopted by Angeletos and Cotters in the paper that I mentioned earlier, as well as by uh, Basu and Cotters when looking at the drivers of risky business cycles. Within our framework, uh, we apply this strategy to identify a shock that explains the maximum share of volatility of cyclical uh, unemployment. The third and final step is then to evaluate the contribution of the identified shock to movements of inflation over the business cycle. So our paper uh, proposed, provides four key results. Uh, the first one, uh, first we find that over the business cycle, 
uh, there is a strong empirical connection between real activity and, and inflation. Specifically, the shock that we identified explains nearly 30% uh, of uh, the movements in cyclical realized uh, inflation and nearly 50% of movements in uh, cyclical inflation expectations. Second, we argue that it is crucial to extract business cycle measures of real activity and inflation to properly address the question at hand. If we instead adopt an approach that doesn't explicitly account for movements in these variables at frequencies other than the business cycle, then the shock that we identify at business cycle frequencies only explains 8% of the volatility of uh, cyclical inflation. Third, we show that standard VR models have difficulties in uh, capturing this business cycle relationship. This result holds even when we impose long-run priors that seek to uh, capture co-integrating relationship within uh, US data. And the last and final um, result that I will not have time to cover in detail during this presentation uh, is to provide a theoretical reconciliation between our results and those of uh, previous studies. Specifically, we will show a mapping between a trend, a trend cycle VRs and standard VRs, and we will show that uh, for the question at hand, VR are misspecified to study this question and point to this uh, disconnect between real activity and inflation because of this misspecification problem. So let me then uh, dive in into uh, the detail of our uh, data and method. So starting from data, uh, we consider four series, which are standard and taken from uh, the St. Louis uh, database. So we consider uh, growth rate of real GDP per capita, uh, the unemployment rate, the effective federal funds rate, and the inflation rate measures uh, from the GDP price index. In addition to these four series, we also uh, consider three expectation series. Uh, the first one is a measure of one year ahead inflation expectations um, taken from the SPF, SPF and therefore starting from uh, the early 70s. The second is a measure of longer run inflation expectations uh, for CPI and we then adjust this measure to uh, account for the, uh, the historical difference between CPI and price GDP inflation measures. Um, and finally, so these first two measures are useful for us in order to robustly uh, extract a latent uh, trend for inflation uh, movements. And finally, according, following the same logic, we then also consider uh, a measure of one year ahead unemployment rate expectation that is also taken from the SPF uh, and starts from uh, 1968. So given this data, we consider the period between 1955 and 1959 as a pre-sample period to uh, set initial conditions and priors, and finally, uh, we consider the period between 1960 and 2019 as the uh, estimation period of interest. So given these uh, observables, our, the, the composition that we assume are uh, for, for each of these observable are presented in this slide. At the top, we look uh, at the growth rate of real GDP per capita, and we assume that it follows a trend plus a cyclical component measure as the log differences in uh, the, le the log level of, uh, of output. Next, then we consider the two unemployment rate measures. The first one is realized unemployment rate, and the second is the one year ahead unemployment rate expectation. And here the key assumption is that the two share a common trend, tau u, but each of the two measures has, follows its own cyclical component, uh, cu and cu with the um, superscript uh, e. Then we consider the three uh, inflation measures. The first one is realized, and then and the, the following two are two uh, inflation expectations measures. And here uh, we also assume that the three have follow a common trend, tau pi. For realized inflation, we then assume that the uh, realized inflation follows its own cyclical component, and then a negative moving average uh, 
a component for measurement errors that we derive by assuming that the measurement error is initially on the log of the price level and therefore when constructing the measure of uh, inflation then we obtain this uh, uh, first difference in, in the measurement errors. The one year ahead inflation expectations fo uh, follows it, the, the common trend as well as its cyclical component, while the longer run measure of inflation expectation follows the same trend, and then it can load on the common inflation expectation uh, cyclical component uh, by means of the loading delta, which we assume to be smaller than one. And then for any um, discrepancies, we allow for a measurement error uh, for the longer run inflation expectations. And finally, as standard in the literature, we assume that the effective federal funds rate follows a trend um, for the real um, interest rate, tau r, as well as a trend of inflation, tau, tau uh, pi, and then a cyclical component. So once we uh, assume this decomposition, then we can derive a measurement equation. So we denote by zt is going to be our uh, vector of observables. And one, we, once we define the vector of latent uh, trends, tau t, cycles, ct, and measurement errors, uh, eta t, then we can derive the measurement equation as the first equation in blue where the observables collected in the vector ZT are related to uh, the laden uh, variables collected in the vector ZT XT by means of this uh, matrix uh, lambda. So what we still need to um, specify our uh, model is a state transition equation. And uh, as common in this literature, we assume that trends follow a unit root process. Um, and each trend is, for, has, is subject to its own uh, shock, which we collect in the, in, the, in the vector epsilon tau. And then the, the cycles, we assume that they follow a standard VR process uh, of like P, which in our baseline will be, uh, we will consider two legs. So finally, we can uh, uh, construct the resulting transition equation, which is uh, presented at the bottom. And, um, and we assume that the shocks uh, to the cycles, um, the trends, and the measurement error shocks are all uh, uncorrelated among each other. So at this point, it's important to, kind of to pause and see why, uh, what are the advantages of using a trend cycle VR model relative to standard VRs to uh, address the question at hand. Um, specifically, our framework allows to automatically separate the trends and cycle without the need of taking a specific stand on, uh, stance on the length of the business cycles. Moreover, cycles and trends are um, explained by different sets of parameters, which will be important at the time of identifying a shock driving a business cycle fluctuations. And finally, I, our framework allows for the possibility of talking about relationship between cyclical <clears throat> inflation and uh, movement in the output or unemployment gap, as these will uh, be considered to be the latent uh, cycles in, in these variables. So this slide shows the output of our estimation procedure. So here I'm showing seven panels, one for each of the observables that we consider in our specification. In each panel, the red line, the red line is, uh, corresponds to the data, while the dashed blue line corresponds to the 68 posterior density interval. Um, and as we can see, uh, our procedure um, delivers trends that uh, have uh, that basically display facts about the US economy which are uh, well known we see uh, the trend of real gdp growth per capita falling uh, and especially being low toward in the latest uh, two decades the unemployment rate rising in uh, the, in the 80 in the 70s and peaking in the 80s before falling down and then increasing again in uh, during the the great financial crisis um, you can notice that the trend of the unemployment rate is common between the two measures of realized and expected inflation. And then when we look at the three panels at the bottom, we can see that as it is well known, trend inflation rises uh, in the 70s, peaks uh, at the time in the early uh, 80s when then um, 
the appointment of Paul Volcker uh, led to uh, a decrease at basically of, of inflation and therefore anchoring of inflation expectations, which kept uh, also inflation uh, down over the most recent period. So from the estimation procedure, we also extract latent cycles, uh, which even in this case um, display features which are well known. As you can see, the latent cycles for realized and expected inflation uh, tend to uh, rise during recession and gradually decline during recoveries and similar for inflation measures. So they tend to be, um, inflation tends to decrease during recessions and then slowly increase during uh, the recovery. So using the latent cycles that I just shown, we identify uh, a shock by targeting the latent uh, cycle for realized unemployment rate. So here, uh, and after identifying the shock, then we look at the contribution of the shock for each of the variables of interest, in particular the latent cycles. In this table, I'm showing the key result of uh, the paper. So the shock that we identified by construction explains a large fraction of the variability of realized inflation, which is the first um, the first uh, row, uh, the first column in the table, and as expected, and in line with other uh, papers, we can see that this shock explains also a, a relatively large share of uh, movements in other real variables such as output and uh, expected unemployment rate. What is now relative to the previous uh, studies, uh, the most recent studies, that this shock explains uh, about 30% of the volatility of cyclical realized inflation and nearly 50% of the volatility of expected uh, inflation. Here in this in this slide, I'm looking at uh, I'm reporting the inputs responses that we obtain uh, from the identified shock, and as you can see, the shock resembles uh, a demand shock that has, uh, however, like implications also for inflation and realized both realized and expected, and this is in contrast with uh, the recent uh, papers that um, argue uh, argue in favor of a disconnect between real activity and inflation. So the second important finding of our paper is that uh, it is crucial to explicitly account for movements of uh, these real activity and inflation measures at low, uh, at low frequencies. So in order to show this, we estimate our specification of our trend cycle VR model, but in this case we're assuming that uh, trends are constant. So we're trying to get close to a VR specification. And in this case, we see that even if uh, we identify the shock uh, on, um, on the latent cyclical component, which in this case would correspond to the mean uh, realized unemployment rate, and we identify the shock at business cycle frequencies, we can see that the shock still explains a large fraction of the volatility of the real variables but it explains a relatively small uh, portion of the movements in realized and, and expected inflation. And these magnitudes are in line with the, with the results of Angelators and Cotters, which indeed use um, a standard VR model to uh, obtain their, their results. So the third uh, key finding of our paper basically consists of showing that VRs have difficulties in uncovering this uh, empirical relation between real activity and inflation at business cycle frequencies uh, with finite data. And in order to, to check for this uh, and to explain our difference, differences of our results relative to those of other findings, uh, we, we, in one case, we impose alternative long run uh, priors, um, which Cap, try to seek to capture co-integrating relationship between uh, data in uh, for the U.S. Uh, or alternatively, we consider subsamples that uh, are less subject to uh, low frequency uh, variation. 
In this presentation, I will only kind of focus on the first uh, case. Indeed, uh, here in this table, I'm reporting the results that we obtained by estimating standard VR models in two cases. With the first row is the case in which we estimate the standard VR model simply with um, standard Minnesota priors, while in the second case, in addition to the Minnesota priors, we also impose long-run priors, a la Giannone and, and co-authors. And as you can see, the shock still, uh, in both cases, still explains a large portion of uh, movements in real variables. Um, but for inflation, um, whether you estimate the model with standard Minnesota priors or also with a long-run priors, it makes it improves the results, but uh, still uh, the magnitudes are still well below those that we uncover by means of uh, our flexible specification. So I would just like to to conclude. These are the main uh, findings that we that we have in the paper. We present uh, evidence of a strong empirical nexus between real activity and uh, and inflation, and we argue in this paper that it is crucial to control for low frequency uh, movements in in these variables. In particular, we argue that trend cycle VR models are. Uh, better suited than standard VR models to capture this business cycle relationship between inflation and real activity. And this is because while trend cycle VR models can accommodate movements of this variable at other frequencies, uh, VR models, standard VR models, suffer from a misspecification problem, which ultimately points to a dis empirical disconnect between real activity and, and inflation. And uh, in the paper, uh, there is clear more more uh, more results, and in particular, we focus also on the on this fourth final result about the theoretical mapping between trend cycle VRs and um, and standard VRs, and we indeed show that with finite data uh, and uh, and a fine number of legs, a standard uh, VR model has uh, difficulties of of capturing this relationship because of uh, an underlying misspecification problem. So thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Giovanni, for a great and very interesting first presentation. Uh, now let me give the floor to Marta Bambura, who's a lead economist in our forecasting and policy modelling division in DG Economics at the ECB. So Marta will discuss the paper before we open the floor for questions. So Marta, you have 10 minutes. Thanks. Yes, um, thank you. So good morning. I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss this um, very interesting, uh, well executed and uh, comprehensive paper. Um, before I continue, I, well, uh, I like to mention that the usual disclaimer applies that uh, these are obviously my own views. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so, so this is an outline, it's a short presentation. I will start with, like, you know, um, <clears throat> phrasing the problem and in particular pointing, uh, pointing some, some differences to the approach on Angeletus et al. This is in a way a starting, uh, a starting point for this paper. Then I will offer some remarks and I will conclude by, you know, proposing some further references uh, to other work, maybe like, you know, put, putting like, you know, connecting um, like this work to like, you know, more empirical uh, forecasting literature. All right, so uh, so the question is relatively straightforward. Uh, so is there a strong relationship between unemployment or activity and inflation at business cycle frequencies? And this is an, uh, like, you know, I guess like uh, by now we all know, uh, given also the previous two, uh, um, uh, presentations that this is now like you know a very topical question there is an important uh, debate on this so it's important you know both for theoretical macro for empirical uh, macro and importantly also you know for policy makers when we talk about like you know the steepness of the Phillips curve the sacrifice ratios and so on um, <clears throat> Okay, so, uh, you know, so, so as I mentioned, the paper sort of like starts uh, with the AER paper of Angeletos when the answer to this question is no. So what they do is they fit the VAR and then they, um, they identify a, a, a shock to unemployment, essentially, or the shock that moves unemployment at business cycle frequencies um, using uh, frequency domain techniques. And then they say that this shock does not explain uh, much variability of inflation in, um, at, at business cycle frequencies. 
And what this paper does is it says, well, actually the answer changes if you are more careful or you know, use the more sophisticated models to explicitly account uh, for low frequency movements in the variables of interest. And like, you know, the, uh, the debate has been there for long. So later I will cite like, you know, a paper that is essentially 30 years old. And like, you know, so, so basically like the decades uh, long debate and the paper um, offers some important insights. And I overall, I agree with the approach and I find the results uh, convincing. However, I have some questions on the interpretation of the difference uh, with respect to Angelatos. So, um, I don't find yet enough evidence, like, you know, on the interpretation that this is indeed the misspecification, like, you know, of the model in particular on the low frequency versus that you're after different objects of interest. And to illustrate uh, this better, I have to, um, you know, uh, talk a bit more about the methodology. So basically what Angeletos et al. do, they estimate the VAR for, uh, for for their vector of observables xt, then they invert it, so they get this moving average representation when a, well, et are orthogonal, so like, you know, you can think about it as, as structural shocks, then a, uh, a, this, uh, this is basically this moving average based on Cholesky decomposition, and q is the identification uh, matrix. And then uh, they do identification, partial identification in the frequency domain. Um, so basically, they search for a um, column of Q that I denote by this uh, lowercase Q um, <clears throat> that would maximize, like, you know, to find the shock that would maximize, you know, those movements at business cycle frequencies for unemployment. And they do it using frequency domain techniques. So, so basically, frequency domain techniques rely on this idea that every station, each stationary series can be expressed as an aggregation of an infinite sum of waves of different periodicities. And these waves have a random amplitude, which are summarized by an object called spectral density. And basically, once you have the spectral density, which shows you sort of like which periodicities are, uh, you know, important for your series, you can also actually go back to, uh, to derive the autocovariances of the series. So, so, you know, they use this insight basically. So what you see here um, is essentially the spectral density of this, uh, of this object. And they, you know, and they, in order to identify Q, then they don't take the spectral density over the entire domain, but they focus on specific uh, frequencies uh, to maximize your Q. All right, and in this, and basically what this paper says is that this is too simplistic, so, so that you shouldn't do it for XT, but you should further decompose XT to tau, which is the trend, T, which is the cycle, and for some series, you also have some measurement errors. And basically they say that you should maximize only on the C. So basically forget about tau and eta and focus on C. And this is an important uh, difference, as I will argue. Um, so basically my question is like, you know, is it really the specification of the low frequency movements or is this that you're sort of optimizing or you're having in mind different objects? So in particular, uh, like, you know, if you think about the framework of Angelatos, they do not discard tau t and eta t. And there could be also this uh, business cycle frequency waves in there. So there is basically nothing in your uh, estimation that excludes the fact that you could have some business cycle, business cycle movement in, uh, in eta and tau. And, uh, and I will give some example in a moment. And in this, so in the paper, you basically define the cycle differently from Angelatos, where you, uh, when you uh, focus on C. And maybe a bit of a side comment is that you use business cycle and cycle interchangeably. And sometimes it's a bit confusing because as I said, also CT could contain different waves. Uh, so not necessarily only big business cycle ones. So the question is like, you know, whether this object that you ma maxim, as much you know, but Angeletus optimized for like, you know, the parts for the tau and for the eta are almost zero. Because if they are not, then basically like, you know, Angeletus will also use those 
to optimize their procedure while you uh, abstract from them. And there is a bit of tension of frequency, uh, frequency domain versus time domain uh, definition, because Angeletus use like, you know, this frequency domain definition where you, where you focus on the time uh, domain definition. And this is also relevant to your Monte Carlo experiments. In particular, you simulate the tau, and you know, in the simulation, there is nothing to prevent also this business cycle waves to appear there. So, you know, if they are important there, then like, you know, the procedure of Angeletos would not aim, like, you know, would not focus on CT, right? So, so like, you know, it's a bit unfair to measure it, like, you know, how well it, it does for CT if it's not uh, focusing on CT. Okay, and I give you a simple example. So, um, basically, forget about the low frequency movement. So, I have here the simple model where the unemployment rate is given just by the cycle and inflation is given by the cycle and by some measurement error, which is a white noise. And, and so, like, you know, if you think about your framework, then inflation, like, you know, is perfectly uh, explained by the cycle, right? It's, it's just the same variable. However, if I do angeletus here, one has to remember that for white noise, like, you know, there are also business cycle frequencies there. So in particular, there's object that you're optimized will not be zero over the business cycle frequencies. And so if you do, uh, like, you know, the approach of angeletus here, like this part connected to eta will appear in your denominator. So like, you know, if there are important measurement errors here, in Angeletos et al, you know, you will get, like, you know, low explanation of CT for inflation. But, you know, this has nothing to do with the low frequency trends. It's just that, like, you know, you're after different objects. Okay. Um, so, like, you know, I, as I said, I agree with your approach, but interpretation, well, I think one would need um, some more analysis there. And also some more clarity on the definition. And then I have um, another remark is on the uh, model specification. So when I read like, you know, your VAR, I was thinking what are the roles of the expectations in particular, whether they help you pin down uh, some stuff like trend cycle measurement errors or they're there in their own right because you're uh, interested also in the transmissions for those variables. Then, for example, why do you use short-term expectations for unemployment and long-term expectations for inflation to pin down um, the trends, doing it all the variables? Why only you have two measurement errors for two specific variables? Why do you consider particular variations of the model? So, so this was a bit like, uh, difficult to understand, at least from the version of the paper uh, that I got. And the like, general question is, do we need such a complicated model? Because it seems that your results are robust to a simpler one. So why not use a simpler one? And then I have some smaller remarks. So one uh, refers to this prior uh, for the trend. So the prior for the trend is very tight with a very small variance. And the question is, and, and here you follow the Negro et al. So the question is whether you really need such a tight prior. Um, because you pin, so this usually you need if you like, you know, let the trend vary freely. But since you pin it here to expectation, maybe you don't need. And also I was wondering how dogmatic this prior is. So looking at priors versus posteriors would be interesting. Then in your, um, in your, some of your simulation studies, some uh, results is particular the case too, where you vary, like, you know, how important is the trend in unemployment goes a bit against the results in Angeletos that they try, you know, this, um, robustness to taking unemployment gap versus unemployment. And I was wondering whether this is related, like basically that when you do the simulation, you might have in your tau t actually some business cycle, like, you know, element. And one question that I have is actually in general, how this method works for non-stationary. <laughs> okay, but okay, then we, maybe we can, um, we can talk about this later. So the paper that is very old that I, that I wanted to mention is actually Stockton Watson in 94 that used very similar methods that you uh, study in, in, the, in one year of initial sections. So they also have like this decomposition into trend, business cycle and irregular, and they have uh, similar uh, insights. So I, I guess it would be nice to refer to this paper, basically saying that you get similar results with, with different methods. And finally, um, like, you know, this idea of modeling inflation gap or abstracting from 
uh, like you know, modeling separate the trends and cycles has been there in a, in a, for a while in forecasting literature, and now you also show that it's important, like you know, if, as you look uh, in inflation drivers. And and I just do like a, a, a couple of examples. There are also some semi-structural models that show the importance of of like you know the separation. And then there are like two important like interesting papers like looking more at this uh, frequency, like you know, the relationships at different frequencies that you might want to look at. Sorry, I'm late on after. So thanks a lot, Marta, for that very interesting discussion. Uh, just to remind our participants online, we're monitoring WebEx in case there's any questions coming in. Um, to give Giovanni time to um, answer adequately, maybe in case I'd like to take maybe one or two questions from the room or from WebEx, if there are any, to kickstart. Yes, we've got two questions here, so. I was just I was just wondering because it's possible for inflation and activity to be strongly correlated and still for the slope of the Phillips curve to be small. So could you back up from your estimation uh, something that would inform the slope of the Phillips curve and would that be very different from estimation that uh, are obtained from non VR? Thanks a lot. And we've one another question here at the front of the room. Sorry. Uh, so I wanted, I mean, the Phillips curve is a conditional correlation, conditional on one shock, a demand shock, as opposed to a supply shock. The way I understood Angeletto's is that he says, well, let me take a linear combination of, let's say, demand and supply shocks, and the one that explains the most, well, consistent with the covariance in the data. And so it's perfectly normal for it to explain zero of inflation and yet tell me nothing about the Phillips curve. It just says that, imagine a world in which 50% are demand shocks, 50% are supply shocks, that explains 100% of output, and it happens to cancel out exactly on inflation and it's 0% there. So unconditionally, you can get any of them. So should I interpret your result as saying that in the long run, there are mostly supply shocks that are uncorrelated with inflation? But in the short run or at the business cycle frequency, we have some demand shocks. And how do I link that with, the, say, the Tenreiro and others' work, noting, well, the, the central bank's demand shocks are themselves a response to supply shock, and therefore you're telling me something about how central banks are effective or not at long run versus short run, which combines both what they can do with what they have tried to do. Thanks a lot. Maybe I'll give the floor then to Giovanni to give him enough time to respond. All right, thank you. Yeah, can you? First of all, thank you so much, Mara. This was very insightful, uh, insightful discussion. Uh, there were quite a few points. I tried to take uh, some notes, but I think that the, the 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 two key relevant ones were in terms of like the interpretation of uh, what we consider cycle. So the what are cycles business cycles in Angeletto's framework in our framework whether it's a it's a it's a fair comparison um the way in which i've been thinking about this is that it, to a certain extent our uh framework is more flexible and could potentially it's kind of be thought of as a generalization of uh, a vr model so within our specification we do have room for uh, obtaining the results. So there is room for having uh, basically um, the same interpretation of uh, what is what is a cycle. However, what we find in data is that once you allow for these low frequency components, um, the data do prefer that specification in terms of they do find these uh, latent trends in the variables and then it turns out to be kind of relevant for what are um, the latent cycles that, that we extract. And I think that this then bridges nicely with the, with the second point in terms of like, um, whether like business cycle frequencies may still be present in trends or um, the measurement error parts. I think that um, we may do more work on that. For now, the way in which we have been uh, thinking about it was the concern instead of uh, whether like the business cycle, uh, the, the cyclical components that we extract are actually um, kind of reflective of uh, the business cycle frequencies and whether it's that like low frequency or measurement errors uh, were part were still part of the 
um, of the latent cycles that we extract. And for this reason, in the paper, we, we, we do have kind of some uh, extra analysis that um, basically seeks to address this point by identifying the shock not on the entirety of the frequencies of the latent cycles that we uh, obtain, but also we do analysis by means of identifying a shock that uh, basically removes the high frequency component to uh, the cycle part, and we see that the results there are still valid. Uh, but we can certainly kind of make a little bit more work in terms of like figuring out whether uh, some business cycle parts are uh, business cycle frequency are still part of the trends as well as measurement errors. Uh, for the priors, uh, they are tied. We have been clearly kind of this has been a topic of. Um, Kind of debate in terms of like the, this specific this model specification. One of the first concerns that uh, is is raised is indeed about the identification of these latent cycles and latent trends. And so we do have robustness uh, analysis in terms of like alternative priors uh, to the trends. And but this is um, so we find that for what we consider reasonable sets of priors, uh, the results are kind of uh, robust. Clearly, and that's kind of the second result, uh, key result of our um, of our paper. If those priors to the shocks to the trend are too tight in terms of like assuming almost like a constant trend, that's when we go back to uh, the the world of um, a disconnection between real activity and uh, and inflation. Um, on the point of making the model simpler, I welcome it, and I think the way we're, we're thinking actually uh, about that, we have received this comment um, while presented at, at, at different conferences this summer. So I think we can we can totally try to make the the framework a little bit more simpler. Um, and the last um, questions from uh, the floor, I think that I could probably try to combine the answer uh, because it seems kind of uh, similar. Um, fair point, the, the way in which the shock is identified is by means of a linear combination of the shocks. Um, it is, however, still interesting that the way even that the shock that is identified and when we look at these impulse responses, it does look like a, a demand shock. So you see that uh, economic, act when you have like uh, a shock that strength the economic activity, then you see also inflation rising. And this was uh, the sense to which we were um, considering it and labeling as a demand shock, and therefore this narrative of the, of the new Keynesian Phillips curve. I think that more work could be done there. Uh, different sets of kind of additional uh, price, additional restrictions, maybe some restrictions could, could be uh, a way there to help kind of uh, discriminate a bit, like the way in which we identify this, this shock. Uh, and kind of give a little bit more of a um, structural sense in terms of uh, being considered as a demand shock and therefore linking better to then what are the implications for the theories and the models that uh, could be built based on this empirical empirical work. But thank you very much for, for all these suggestions. This has been very, very helpful. Thanks a lot, Giovanni, and also Marta for the nice discussion. Uh, next, I'm delighted to welcome Gauti Egertsen um, to the to the stage. Gauti is a professor of economics at Brown University, um, and this morning he is presenting a paper um, with a rather ominous title. It's back: uh, the surge in inflation in the 2020s and the return of the nonlinear Phillips curve. And this is joint work with uh, Pierpaolo Benino of University of Bern. So, Gauti, you've 25 minutes, and the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. And let me just uh, acknowledge right up front that the title is stolen from Paul Krugman. He had a, a paper called It's Back, referring to the liquidity trap in 98. Uh, here we were playing on that because, uh, uh, you know, we are suggesting that the original Phillips curve, like I'll explain to you in a second, uh, is back. So what's the motivation for this talk? Well, the motivation is pretty straightforward. It is that a bunch of us, uh, myself included, were spectacularly wrong in the spring of uh, 2021. This was right after the Biden stimulus uh, that some, including uh, my co-author and uh, 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 
and uh, Larry Summers uh, warned would uh, cause very high inflation, and I said no. Uh, uh, I predicted no, and even worse in the fall. After you know, if you recall, there was a run up in inflation in uh, uh, in the summer, and Larry was running victory laps, uh, and I was still strong and team temporary, saying no, this is all much to do about nothing. Uh, it's going to come down, and I even wrote a op-ed about it. Fortunately, it was written in uh, it was only published in Japanese, so nobody has seen it. Uh, saying that you know it was going to come down but then you know later events of course turned out that i was spectacularly wrong uh so you know there were some there's some in the team temporary sort of that tried to twist themselves into pretzel to say well it's sort of temporary ish uh it's coming down now but i think at the end of the day no i mean it was really a first order uh mistake so i guess like kane said you know uh, when confronted with having made a wrong uh, prediction, well, when the facts change, I changed my mind. What do you do, sir? So, so this uh, uh, paper is about how I have changed my mind about the inflation dynamics following making a sort of a first or order error in forecasting. Because my in my back of my mind at the time was just a standard Keynesian model. Okay, so uh, the summary of this paper is. Uh, what we're going to propose is a nonlinear Phillips curve. And as it turned out, that is actually much more in line with Phillips' original Phillips curve than what we have come to know uh, to be the Phillips curve later. Uh, and we're going to argue that this nonlinearity kicks in. We're going to call this labor shortage. I mean, that's just a word, which is going to be some threshold for vacancies over you. You know, in the first version of the paper, we kind of emphasized the unitary value, but like I suppose was saying, I don't, you know, there's nothing particular in the theory that says that the threshold needs to be uh, one. It could be, uh, it could vary over time. It could be different between countries and even regions. And I think that's an, and I'll comment on that a little bit, although one seemed to work remarkably well in the aggregate in the U.S., as you're going to see in a minute. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk. We're going to talk about this nonlinearity kicking in when the labor market is sufficiently tight, and by tight, it is going to be important. This V over U, and I'm going to show you why that is important, as opposed to only measuring tightness by unemployment. Uh, so I'm going to first. Uh, the structure of the talk is that I'm first going to provide some evidence, then I'm going to provide a theory. Uh, and, uh, you know, explain the inflation uh, uh, due to labor shortage. Uh, so that's going to trigger inflation. Uh, and it's going to trigger inflation beyond just, uh, you know, increasing marginal cost as measured by uh, wages. So there's a recent paper by Blanchard and Bernanke who sort of attribute most of, of the uh, uh, inflation surge to supply factors, but in their uh, paper, the labor market is really just forced to only operate in the Phillips curve through real wages. There's not an independent mechanism through which uh, labor market tightness can have an effect, but we're going to see in this model, it is going to uh, have an effect independently of uh, uh, real wages. More importantly, perhaps, is that uh, and this is actually key and something we have emphasized more now as we have or in the states of rewriting the paper, it's in continuous, uh, hopefully converging on something, uh, which is that in an era of labor shortage, when VU is above some critical matter, uh, a key aspect, a key prediction of the model, it's gonna actually make the supply shocks much more inflationary. Okay, and we're gonna show that both in the data and it's gonna be true in the model. And in the model, it's gonna be kind of very simple. I mean, you have two inputs, labor and some intermediate input, and they're going to be imperfect substitute. So if then uh, you have tightness in labor and you have increase in costs on the other input, well, it's going to be uh, any uh, effect of the increase in the price of the intermediate input, given that it's hard to substitute, is going to make uh, the effect of price increases all the bigger. So it's going to be this combination. So uh, our story is going to be labor tightness, but it is also going to be supply shocks. But the supply shock in combination with labor tightness, and we're going to be able to see in the data, we can decompose these. Okay, uh, 
policy implications, uh, like uh, was actually pointed uh, out here in uh, in the nice uh, introductory speech we had here. Uh, soft landing is very much possible. So I decided even to stick my neck out uh, and predicting a soft landing a few months ago, just, you know, maybe to be invigoratingly wrong again, and that would have led to uh, uh, another paper where I'd have to change my mind yet again. Although, but I think I have been inspired enough to start making more predictions. Okay, now this here, what you see is actually the original Phillips curve. And what you notice immediately about it, and this is in his paper in the Economic Journal 1958, is how nonlinear it is. And in fact, the ending sentence of the first paragraph of the paper is saying that that's the main point, that it is very nonlinear. And the argument he makes is that when the labor market is very tight, so that's towards the uh, zero in unemployment, then firms start bidding uh, each other, against each other to raise wages, while when the uh, labor market is lax, when there's high unemployment, workers are going to be very, very uh, reluctant to accept uh, uh, cuts in their, w in their wages relative to prevailing wages due to some wage norms or downward uh, rigidities in wages. And that's going to be an idea that we're going to leverage on. Uh, and it's actually uh, harks back to uh, the original Keynesianism, uh, the crude Keynesianism, what Alan Blinder calls it in his, in his, in his uh, new book, which was basically the idea that prices were just fixed in the short run, right? And that was the Keynesian economy. And here uh, I've compared it to this estimated Phillips curve, just in one minus mu, this is Philip's actual curve, just here, just replotted. And the point of the crude Keynesianism was that, okay, you operate it here in the Hicksian world with fixed prices until you hit a wall, right? Uh, when uh, factories are underutilized, you can expand production, but once you have hired all the workers, there's only so much you can do. You know, you run out of work, workers, you hit a wall, and you start just entering a neoclassical world. So that was sort of how they were thinking about it. And when you look at Philip's original estimation, well, it kind of has that fe feature, sort of a, a backwards or inverse L. And that's going to be the type of Phillips curve that we're going to derive. Okay, so the thing is, though, when uh, Phillips writes his paper in 58, what really made the Phillips curve, you know, a household name in, not household, economic household <laughs> name, uh, is the when Phillips came to America, uh, and that's in Solon Samuelson, 1960, AEA, it's a famous paper about trade-offs between inflation and output, and that sort of found its way in all textbooks. But you can kind of see, okay, maybe there's some non-linearities, but that's, that's not anything they talked about. It looked sort of linear-ish, right? Uh, and what happened next, you know, it was not that people started talking about non-linearities, no. It was the fact that this was a static relationship in their paper, and then, you know, come, so it looked really good the first decade after their paper, but then in the 70s, expectations started moving all over the place. And we all know this picture where, it, you know, this sort of led, led to the breakdown of Keynesian economics and the rational expectation uh, revolution. But, you know, what killed the Phillips curve uh, in sort of the official narrative was that expectation became an anchor. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, the uh, pre-collapse, this is a typo, uh, the, the pre-collapse in New Keynesian consensus really was that what was needed was to, you know, augment with the old Keynesian, uh, which was the Solo Samuelson uh, Phillips, where this is a measure of lack, expectations and then some supply shocks. Right, that's sort of where we were. And I think, uh, importantly, the consensus prior to the uh, uh, run-up, and this is one example, and you know, it's one of the panels here, uh, Jonathan Hassel paper with Hirano, Steins, and Nakamura, as a well representative of that consensus, uh, was that, you know, this number here, kappa, was very, very low. Uh, you know, and the, you know, and the important thing to notice is that the sample they were using was 78 to 2018. Okay, just keep that, those dates in mind because that's gonna, their estimate is gonna be completely consistent with what I'm gonna say here. 
Uh, it's just going to be on the flat part of the Phillips curve. So just an example here, you increase unemployment by 1% according to their estimate, inflation just goes down by a third of a percentage, right? So it's very costly to bring down inflation, just like uh, was being discussed before. Uh, so what was the, this was perfectly consistent with the stories of the 70s, because the stories of the 70s then, according to this narrative, had nothing to do with the output gap. It had all to do about expectations. This here shows you the actual inflation in the 70s, and you see in the blue here, uh, inflation expectation as measured by the Livingston survey that goes pretty far back. And you can see that expectations really became unanchored uh, during the 70s. But the thing is, and that's sort of what, that's why a lot of us, uh, like me in, in March and again in the fall, thought that this would be a temporary phenomenon because our frame of thinking was that, well, in order to get inflation really going in a way that's not just some tem temporary supply shock, you really need the expectations to go, right? And this is just one year had expectation. If you looked at five year, five year forwards and, you know, the fall of 2001, they, they were doing nothing. Or, you know, you could talk about, like Ricardo will talk about maybe some tales, but, you know, but compared to the 70s, you know, it was really not doing a whole lot. Uh, okay, so uh, that let us, or, uh, uh, yeah, that led me and, and Peter Paolo to think, okay, so what, what are we missing here? Uh, so we have an inflation, it's not expectations that are driving it, it doesn't look like anything like the 70s, our last uh, great inflation. So maybe we should just look a little bit broader and think about the five great inflation and uh, last five inflation, excluding the 70s. What do they have in common? Um, okay, so let's just take a look at that. What do five inflation surges have in common, excluding the 70s? Well, what you see here, and this is actually, I got this from a paper, I saw this first in a paper by Mich uh, Pasc my uh, former colleague, uh, uh, Pascal Michelat and Emmanuel Saez. So they're not talking about inflation in their paper. They're talking about what is the efficient amount of labor market tightness. And their efficiency criteria is one that you can see here. And one thing that I found was curious was that when this thing goes above one, which is here, post-COVID, and then it is here in the late 60s when you had the run-up of the Vietnam War and the Lyndon Johnson tax cuts, you also see uh, spikes in inflation. And if you go further back, well, uh, the other great examples of uh, very high inflation is uh, World War II, where this measure really go, there's a very tight labor market. And uh, World War I, it doesn't go quite far, but that is another period. Now there's some blips here we could talk about, but these are sort of the five big ones. It's basically uh, World War I, World War II, oh, the Korean War here is another uh, spike. Although we didn't include that in our sample because of price control. We didn't include this either because of price control. One thing I realized in this paper, awful as they may be, and I lived with price control growing up in Iceland, that they're not a good thing by any means, but they do seem to work to some extent. I mean, there's just rationing then, and you know, leads to all sorts of inefficiency, but they do seem to work on headline inflation. Uh, uh, they're, just, they're just a terrible idea for other reasons. Uh, okay, so the key idea then is gonna be that uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna be, I would maybe even make this flatter if I, uh, uh, but this is just, you know, drawn by hand. So the hypothesis, we have been in this region since basically in the sample, for example, that uh, uh, Jonathan and co-author estimated, we have been really in this year region since the, 19, uh, uh, since the early 1970s, uh, basically. Uh, and we haven't been in this year region except for in these uh, five major episodes. Uh, so it's now, but you have to go back to the late 60s to find uh, another example where labor tightness uh, becomes uh, such that you enter this nonlinearity. So labor tightness here, I'm defining as number of vacancies. So that's the number of jobs that firms are trying to fill uh, relative to the number of people looking for those jobs. And in the US, it turns out that a good sort of uh, cutoff is gonna be one. There are more firms looking for workers than workers looking for jobs, but that you know, can be changing with time and uh, across uh, areas and countries. Okay, uh, so uh, let me just uh, uh, get right ahead. 
And, but before that, I do want to just briefly, okay, so why are we emphasizing V over U as opposed to the more traditional U metric? Uh, and, you know, we are not the first to do this. We start seeing a, a bunch of papers emphasizing that this is a better measure in the Phillips curve than unemployment. And the reason is basically uh, this inflation surge. If you look at unemployment, unemployment was still above pre-COVID era from like, this is, uh, this is March 2001, the uh, 21, the, the month after uh, Biden passed the stimulus package. And this year is March 22, when the Fed starts hiking rates. I should have had inflation here, but you kind of know how it looks like. Between these two dashed lines, it just spikes and it peaks at, uh, it starts running up here. And then it, uh, then it pops out when the Fed starts running rates. Uh, so according to this metric here, according to you, there's still slack in the labor market. If you look at labor force particip participation, the favor of the Fed was the prime age, the, because it doesn't have demographic, credit cards, it's prime age uh, workers relative to population. It was also showing some slack. On the other hand, V over U was blinking, you know, red. So it seemed to be picking up this signal much stronger. And that is different from what we had seen in re recent past. U and VU seem to be pretty closely tied together, but here we saw really uh, that VU was given, I think, more accurate information about how tight the labor market was than only looking at these traditional measures like U or, uh, or labor force uh, uh, employed over labor force participation. Okay, so let me just get to the empirical result and then the model, and I've spent too much time, I'm afraid, on. Uh, so this is just data, okay? This is just showing you here, uh, in blue, all the observations from 1960 to today. Uh, this is a log of, of the tightness, and this here is core inflation. Uh, and, and you can see here that it seems so log of one is zero, right? So you can see here when theta goes above one and you get the pink dots, well, something seems to be going on. This here is from in the late 60s and this here is uh, basically uh, in the inflation surge. So in other words, for example, studies that we're focusing on the data from 70 uh, to uh, leading up to all the, all the way up to, let's say 2012, uh, they would just be looking at the blue dot where you're not seeing a very big slope. You really see the slope when you get a very tight labor market. So that's the point of this. And we can formalize this in regression, and that's in fact what we do next. Uh, and we tried to be as uncreative as we could in the sense of taking a regression that many people have run before where you have lagged inflation uh, and you have, uh, like Larry Ball has a similar regression. And here we have measures of inflation expectation. We experiment with a great number of them. Our only innovation, our only innovation is that we add a dummy when uh, mu goes above a critical value and we have some tests what this critical value is. And you know, it is not, you cannot reject that it's just one. So that's just what we stick with. Uh, which is, you know, you can see it in the figure, it seems to, match relatively well, although we don't want to tie our hands necessarily to that as the ultimate truth. And what I want to point out to you here, because we have limited time, is that, you know, the slope, this is the later sample, the slope here of the uh, Phillips curve is, it is relatively flat, but it becomes a lot steeper when you have the dummy, right? And that's just formalizing the, what you saw in the scatter plot, but adding these controls here. The second thing is that uh, here you have this cost push shock. There also you get a huge extra bump. In fact, the effect of cost push shock is not statistically significant from zero, except when you have the dummy. Okay, I mean it is uh, it is has the right sign in the whole sample without the dummy, but uh, you know uh, of of the whole sample period. Uh, but, you know, when you add the dummy, you get really uh, what looks like, especially in this last period, you get this big bang. Okay, so uh, one th 
Five minutes. So one thing is that, you know, there are very moderate supply shock in this period. So it's kind of, okay, how could supply shock be playing such a big role? These are the traditional measures of supply shocks. You know, CPA had land shock, PCE, import price shock principle, and this is the first principle component. But, you know, you know, this doesn't scream at you as huge supply shocks. It only does so if you kind of interacted with uh, this, uh, interacted with this labor shortage. And that's what we do here, just taken from the regression, you see where there are bars. These here are the cost push shocks when they're interacted with the tightness. That's the red with the, 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 the lines in. And then also you see the labor market tightness with interacted with, uh, you know, theta B greater than one. And then, uh, uh, so you see that that is really, the nonlinearity is doing all the work here. You know, the actual cost per shock, the point estimate was negative, although not statistically significant, wasn't doing really anything. It's, it's the combination of the two. Okay, so, uh, so it looks like I only really get to talk about my empirical result here, uh, but don't get to the model. Uh, this is the excitement of the theorists finally having empirics in a paper. Uh, we did here a Kalman filter, and we see also that the weight on the coefficient uh, really runs up when we run this kind of uh, regression. Uh, we do a bunch of robustness checks. Let me just, I wanna, I certainly don't wanna end this uh, 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 talk without uh, mentioning a major, a major uh, motivation for this. Uh, you know, I have a brilliant student, Julia Giddy, who by the way is on the market next year, so, you know, I'll put an explicit advertisement on the bottom of the slide in a second. Uh, and so this is a picture from her paper with Corrado, uh, and you can kind of just see it. So this is cross uh, metropolitan uh, statistical areas. You can see this is just unemployment. There's some pretty clear evidence of nonlinearities here. This is from 2011 to 2023, okay? So this is cross state MSA level. Uh, she just recently got, uh, V over U measures, and you can see similar patterns there. Okay, so, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so here is just my advertisement that my student is gonna be on the market, but this was actually I, the first time I started thinking about this when she was showing me these results, and then that combined with what Pascal was working on led to this. Okay, the model is gonna be done very quickly. The, the model is just good. It's just going to be modeling where it's, uh, there's endogenous labor force participation. I'm just going to flip through these slides. And the key thing is that at the beginning of each period, uh, the household is going to choose labor force participation. There's going to be number of people employed, number of people uh, unemployed. Uh, and uh, there's the, there are going to be some vacancies and there's going to be labor market tightness. Uh, okay, so that is F, just divided into employed, unemployed. How are these things determined? Well, they're going to be determined at the beginning of period. There's going to be just some fraction of people that are attached to firms that belong to the set of employed workers. In the standard Newtonian model, that would be S equal to one. Everybody's attached to a firm. Uh, if S would be equal to one, then everybody would have to search in each period. Okay, so it sort of nests nicely these two cases. Then there's going to be a standard matching function here. And this is then going to be total labor uh, uh, supply that is composed of those that are attached to firms and those that successfully search and match with a firm. Okay, so this is the household's problem, and you're just going to get a labor force uh, participation here decision. That's the new thing relative to what we see usually in these models. The firms are going to be just doing uh, Calvo pricing, not, not Calvo, Rodenberg pricing for simplicity. And the only quote, quote new thing here. It's not really new, but uh, is that you're going to have an intermediate input apart from labor, and this is going to be provided in elastic supply, but it's going to have some exogenous price. So that's going to be one of the cost push shocks. Okay, think about an oil, it's an endowment, and OPEC just decides the, the price, and then, you know, that's going to trigger cost book push variations. That's going to show up in the nonlinear Phillips curve. So what we're going to get then, okay, vacancy creation, First, let me talk about a hot market. That's what uh, Phillips had in mind when there's very no uh, unemployment. In that case, wages are flexible, out of time. Uh, when we get to a normal uh, market, there's gonna be a wage uh, norm uh, because wages are rigid. There is strong evidence that wage, wages 
wage behavior is very sluggish, what we call norm, and we're going to model it in this way. Which one applies is going to basically going to be the uh, max of these. People are happy to have higher wages than the norm, but they would never accept anything lower. And result is going to be a uh, nonlinear Phillips curve. Uh, I'm out of time. Uh, so this is terrible time management. Uh, this thing here, and I'm just going to end by uh, amplifying the point made in the opening speech. The 70s here are a period of shift in expectations, which was very costly to bring down inflation because you were in this part of the curve. This is in my pie space. Now we have the prospect of being on this part of the curve, on the steep end, where it may be a lot cheaper to engineer a drop in inflation, provided we are here meaning that, you know, uh, their prospect for soft landing. So that's, I'm out of time. I'm sorry that I didn't get to go through the model. I assure you that uh, it is very interesting um, <laughs> and it can be bad. Uh, 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 so, so that new framework for understanding inflation spike, replacing the McKinsey and Phillips curve with sort of an inverse LK, new Phillips curve with theta appearing, uh, evidence and policy implications. And I'll just touch on, you know, few of those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gauti, for a very interesting presentation. Very timely, I think, as well. And I hope this time your prediction is right and that we'll have a, a soft landing. Um, to discuss the paper now, uh, we have joining us online Antonella Trigari. Antonella is a, a professor in the economics department um, at Bocconi University. Um, and I see her there online. So welcome virtually to the room, Antonella. You have 10 minutes and um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? We can indeed. Okay, very good. So let me share the screen. Can you see the slides? Yes, all clear. Okay, so we're all set. So thanks. Uh, thank you to the organizer for uh, from for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, conferences. I, I'm uh, very sad I cannot be there, but I thank you for giving me the possibility to, to discuss this paper and to do it uh, um, online. So um, let me start by uh, giving you some well-known, at this point, context for the paper. It, the paper uh, contributes to the debate on the drivers of the COVID era inflation surge, and in particular, it um, uh, tried to answer the question, what caused it and why must economists fail to predict it? Now, the, the possible drivers that have been uh, extensively debated, uh, pre-inflation surge and post-inflation surge are essentially three demand stimulus coming from COVID era fiscal and monetary policies, possibly causing excessive labor market overeating. And within that um, factor driver, the, the debate is really focused on uh, you know, the most appropriate measure of labor market tightness, uh, in particular U versus uh, the ratio of vacancies to unemployment, as well as on the slope of the Phillips curve and in particular on the possibilities of non-linearities in the relationship between tightness and inflation supply disruptions, and then uh, de-anchoring on inflation expectations. Now, the debate is often framed within a conventional nuclear agent Phillips curve, and the view pre-search was, uh, I would say, mostly optimistic. So the idea being that even if um, um, policies and the, the rapidity of the recovery would have caused um, uh, large overeating of the labor market, uh, this would have not caused a large increase in inflation for many two reasons. The first was the low sensitivity of inflation to slack, a small slope uh, coefficient in the inflation curve. And second, that uh, expectations were likely to remain anchored given the, 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 the behavior of inflation in the, in the previous uh, decade. Now, there is a current debate on the drivers of inflation. Many papers are currently being written on what are the most important drivers, what, what is the relative contribution 
of the, vari of the various drivers that I listed in the previous slides, the debate is not subtle. This paper um, concludes that tight labor market, so it says demand, is a key driver and the mechanism is going to be via a non-linearity in the Phillips curve, but there are different views in the literature. And let me just cite a recent prominent paper by Bernard de Blanchard, uh, where, you know, a paper that reaches a, a, a quite a opposite conclusion in terms of the role of uh, labor markets in driving inflation. Now, what does this paper does? Um, so first of all, it measures luck with labor market tightness, the VU ratio. Then it presents evidence of non-linearities in the Phillips curve. And the starting point is to document um, an exceptionally high post-pandemic labor market tightness, as many have done, um, uh, as many others have done as well. But it, it, it also connected to um, labor market tightness in war time. So that those levels uh, have only been seen in post-pandemic, actually even pre-pandemic, you know, during the Trump presidency for a very short period of time, just before the, the pandemic kicked in, and in wartime, World War I, World War II, Korean War, and the Vietnam War. And then it connected to inflation surges uh, and estimates the higher slope coefficient when market tightness is indeed high, specifically above a threshold defined to be one, which is taken to define a labor shortage. And finally, they, and, and this is one of the most important contributions of the paper, they develop a model of a nonlinear Phillips curve. The nonlinearity arises from a symmetric wage setting. And the model, as I will comment, is a, is a I would call it a non conventional search and matching model with labor supply and non forward looking vacancy costs. Then they use the model to explain the great inflation of the 1970s. This, this surge in inflation has been extensively compared to, to um, the great inflation. And so they, they uh, I think, importantly, make the point that the paper can explain both uh, episodes. And in particular, in uh, they, when it comes to explaining the pandemic era inflation, they uh, argue that the model argued that uh, um, the inflation surge is caused by an exceptionally tight labor market, a labor shortage, and that that tight labor market moved the economy on the steep segment of the Phillips curve. And finally, then derive policy implication: a soft landing is indeed possible because a steep Phillips curve implies that. Uh, small um, increases in economic activity can lead to inflation surges, but at the same time, there is also a, a good part of it. It also implies an easy down, small VU reduction will be able to bring inflation under control. Now, <clears throat> the uh, Gotti had quite some time to, to go through the, the, the empirical part of the paper, and he also mentioned that uh, first to document these um, labor shortages in wartime and pandemic time were initially in fact. So what this paper has to that is to connect labor shortages to inflation surge. And then to propose a theoretical mechanism, which is symmetric wage setting. So uh, I think that, I mean, not everything can be doing a single paper, but there is a case for strength and strengthening the empirical results. And in particular, they could, uh, you know, move along the lines of the recent literature and use geographical variation to test exactly their hypothesis and uncover the well-known identification issues in estimating the slope coefficient of the Phillips curve. They could somehow go back, and I think they have in mind uh, to do that, um, to go back in time and include more than just two labor shortage episodes as they do now in their empirical evidence. And finally, I think it would be it would be interesting that something that I've been thinking uh, over these uh, days when when uh, preparing this discussion, whether labor shortages is, is is really the same phenomenon in war times and post pandemic times. For example, there is quite some evidence that during COVID, reallocation rates, matching efficiency 
decreased, or put it differently, the natural rate of unemployment has increased, is that the same during wartime are all labor shortages created equal? That's, I, I think, an important question to ask. Okay, what's going on now? Why? Okay, sorry. Now, the key mechanism they put forward is what I would call a wage setting asymmetry, and they, they refer to Phillips. 1958 original statement with very few unemployed, we should expect employers to beat up wages quite rapidly. Um, instead, when unemployment is high, workers are reluctant to offer their um, services at less than the prevailing rate. The wages fall only very slowly. And the way they formalize it is through a, what I, be co I would call a two wage setting regime. One is normal times, and there they assume rigid wages. And the second one is a labor shortage um, uh, regime where instead flexible wages, uh, where instead wages are flexible. Now they 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 uh, discuss this this wage setting by referring to downward nominal wage agility. But is this really downward nominal wage agility? Uh, indeed, uh, rigid in normal times, wages are going to be rigid upward and downward. And with labor shortages, wages are going to be, you know, flexible, both downward and, and upward. So that's a bit different. And it's, it's, I, I think when I, when I was listening to the introductory remark by Isabel, I found that when uh, she was discussing the evidence that firms are more likely to pass to, customer, to pass on to customer raises in marginal costs and decreases in marginal costs. So there is this asymmetry in the elasticity of inflation to marginal costs. Here it's very similar. Labor market conditions are more likely to affect wages, according to what Phillips is saying, um, when unemployment is decreasing and labor market conditions are improving than when unemployment is increasing. But that's a bit, that's also a bit different from what they are, they are, um, formalizing. So, but independently of the exact form of wage GDP, I think it would be really important to provide some independent micro evidence on wage setting, possibly through some survey, um, uh, through some survey. And I don't know if, if those exist. Now, a non-conventional search and matching model. So what, what the, 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 the model that they put forward is, is different from a standard search and matching model. And it took me some time to I, understand why they do it. I have my own interpretation, which they can confirm. So essentially, they have a standard labor supply decision. If you look at the uh, at the second equation and you abstract from the from the bread component, this is just, uh, you know, marginal uh, disutility from supplying labor. FT is labor supply, labor force participation equal to the wage. And, and that labor supply would be equated in the first equation to a labor demand coming from you know, monopolistically competitive firms. What they do is that they add in an, a bit adapt way a, a role for uh, search and matching, assuming that a fraction one minus S of uh, the labor force is employed every period. And a fraction S is going to be unemployed and searching for a job and so they will find job at a job finding rate, which I call F. -F. Now, um, the, the other so unusual just to on you, is, you're at time now. I'm sorry? Yeah, just to um, warn you that you're, you're almost at time. Okay, thank you. So uh, the other unusual uh, feature is that their, their vacancy passing decision is not going to be forward looking. Um, and and then they 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 have a conventional matching technology that is going to determine you know this job finding rate that enters the the uh, vacancy posting condition from employment agency and the and the labor supply uh, condition from uh, from household. Now, uh, what 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 are the implications of those assumptions? So first is uh, employment is not a state variable. Unemployment, the unemployment rate is actually constant. The job creation is not forward looking and existing matches do not come and rise. And I think that the last implication is what they were looking for because 
this is the benefit of simplifying the introduction of utility because they don't need to take a stand on rent sharing mechanism. At the same time, there are costs. Uh, first of all, rent sharing and forward looking hiring can be relevant mechanisms. But importantly, um, to the debate, I don't think they have a, a, a standard, at least, beverage curve within the model. So it's very hard to frame some key ongoing debate. And in particular, the fact that the beverage curve is indeed informative of the likelihood of a soft landing. And there is some recent research, Blanchard and Domash and Summers and Figure and Waller, where they argue that, um, so what's the idea? The idea is that, um, uh, this inflation will require some reduction in the VU ratio, but a soft landing will it means more than that. It means that VU is going to be reduced mostly with, through lower V and rather than uh, higher U. And to know how the reduction in VU is going to come about, you need information from the beverage curve. In particular, you need to know whether you know, there has been a, a shift in the beverage curve through reallocation and through much efficiency. So can the model accommodate this configuration? I have a couple of slides and then I'm done. So recalls. Um, so, so recalls are extremely relevant for COVID. Most of the increase in uh, unemployment at the onset of the COVID recession was through temporary layoffs. And the, you know, hires include recalls, the, the measure of, and of vacants of kindness that they use include, you know, workers who are on temporary layoff, but, but those workers do not really need to go through a search and matching process to, to go back to employment. So I'm wondering whether the empirical results would be robust to excluding workers from, uh, on temporary layoff from the measure of searchers and their measure of labor market kindness, the VU rich. Um, let me conclude by saying that I think this this is going to be so the paper as is is as Doty said is work in progress. They are working on uh, assessing the the impact of supply shocks. They are you know working on the exact way they want to introduce wage utility, but in general, the main conclusion of the paper is really important for policy prescription for monetary policy. And in particular, I think it's, it's really important when it comes to uh, assessing the you know, recent review of the monetary policy strategies, especially in the US, uh, who put greater, much greater emphasis on the employment mandate relative to the um, inflation stabilization mandate, and in particular, non-linearities in the Phillips curve are going to imply that inflation rates from running the economy halt are greater than was previously established. That the policy prescription that the unemployment is that an unemployment rate well below its natural rate is acceptable and even desirable because it, it you know, because of um, uh, aspect related to the distribution of unemployment might be reconsidered. And finally, the mismeasurement of slot becomes a more serious issue if the Phillips curve becomes steeper when unemployment falls below what is a highly uncertain natural rate. So let me uh, conclude with these slides and thank you uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Antonella, for the very rich discussion. Um, I just want to give Gauti enough uh, time to respond. So maybe I'll just take if there's any burning questions. I think we have one on the panel. Yes, please. Um, thanks for a great paper, Gauti. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask a question that's related to, to one of Antonella's. So I guess an alternative narrative is that labor supply shocks from search frictions are very inflationary. So you can imagine that maybe the slope of the Phillips curve is relatively flat. Um, a big supply shock comes along from search frictions. Specifically, this is something like mismatch that really makes firms want to hire a lot relative to the unemployed. So V over U goes up very much. Um, you can imagine this after COVID being sectoral reallocation. You can imagine during war times too, there being a lot of sectoral reallocation in and out of a war economy. Um, and, and so then the primitive shock driving things is, is more like a, a search friction shock. Uh, when it dissipates, inflation falls. 
that's a very different narrative. It's a very different uh, set of implications for policies. And I was just wondering your thoughts on that, whether or not you can rule it out in your model um, in favor of the alternative sort of nonlinear slope instead of uh, search friction shock story. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot to the discussant for an excellent discussion. Uh, and also let me apologize to the discussant because the paper is a bit of a moving target. And I sent her a uh, revised version just uh, last week, uh, which, uh, in which case some of the issues that you raise are, are no longer there. For example, the unemployment is not a constant, it moves over time. But, you know, the earlier version that was right that, uh, uh, it is true that the search and matching model is uh, somewhat non-standard and uh, in particular it's a period by period. It's not like uh, uh, forward-looking uh, bargaining. And uh, our assessment, I mean, we were trying to get a simple uh, model as possible that would nest sort of the standard New Keynesian model. Uh, and we felt that uh, this was a reasonable assumption for uh, what we had in mind. Now, one thing we would say there is, and we didn't, we don't, didn't have not yet had time to, to flash that out, and that relates also to Jonathan's question. I mean, the model does have a barrier square, like uh, underlying barrier square, uh, that, uh, you know, we should have a section of. And the reason why we introduced, uh, you know, I didn't have time to really go through the model, but we've introduced shock to the matching technology to the marginal cost of posting and the marginal cost uh, of uh, the marginal benefit and marginal cost of, of the matching agency. So we are just in the middle of analyzing how we can reconcile uh, the behavior of the beverage curve to uh, those uh, to what we see in the data. I'm not so, I think the, the, the model is rich enough so it can speak to some of those questions such as if those matching friction, you know, are in reduced form, or reduced form representation of sexual shift. I have to say that we have been looking at the sexual shift story by looking at, uh, you know, vacancies over employment uh, cross sector, and I was expecting there to be some big asymmetries there, but uh, we haven't actually found that empirically speaking. But you know, that's something we are looking at. Uh, at the moment. Now, so why do we just emphasize these two episodes and don't go further back? The big problem with uh, like having the Korean War, World War II, and World uh, is, uh, well, we only have part of the data for World War I, but for the Korean War and World War II is price control. So you can really see, if you saw the arrows in my, uh, in my slides, that they become very binding. So we kind of then we need to enrich the model with a theory of how uh, price control affect inflation, uh, then we felt that might just complicate things a lot. Uh, I agree that uh, going and looking across state variation is important. And in fact, that's what my student, Julia Gitti, is doing and is going to write a much better paper than I present today, which is why I should all hire her next fall. Uh, but uh, uh, it was anything else. Uh, Yeah, no, I think that's, oh, uh, uh, one thing uh, to say, though, about the wage setting there, uh, I guess it wasn't made clear enough in the presentation, partially because it went very fast, is that the wage specification does uh, encompass as a special case uh, just purely uh, uh, downward rigid wages for particular parameters, uh, because there was a max operator there that chose you know, the workers are willing to uh, accept higher wages than the wage norm, but they're not willing to accept anything below it. So, you know, and in that wage norm was lag normal wages. So if you chose parameters in a particular way, it would just be simply uh, downward rigid wage. But we have a more general specification, which is just meant to capture sort of inertia and wage behavior that, that we see. Uh, but, you know, we're not, yeah, but I think it's a point well taken that we should try to connect it a little bit better uh, with the data. The, uh, in the end, what we get is a Phillips curve that is pretty relatively conventional, uh, but um, in the aggregate. 
but the micro data is not necessarily there to support uh, this. This is more like just a specification that gives us a conventional looking Phillips curve. Great. Thank you very much, Gauti. I believe we've got some questions online, but just to keep to the time, maybe we can follow up bilaterally on those afterwards. Um, so that brings me then to the last paper of this session. Um, that's going to be given by Luca Gagliardoni, who's a PhD candidate in New York University. So he's going to be presenting today a paper on the anatomy of the Phillips curve, which uses micro evidence uh, to make macro implications. So this is joint work with Mark Ertler and Simone Lenzu at NYU and Yaris Tillmans at Bank of Belgium. So uh, you're very welcome, Luca. You've got 25 minutes and the floor is yours. OK, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm pretty excited to be here. Uh, so the usual disclaimer applies. He says uh, the Bank of Belgium. So uh, today what I'm going to discuss is uh, uh, estimation of the slope of the Phillips curve, the Newcane Asian Phillips curve, which um, is a key equation as we as we know from the previous presentations because it is uh, informative on uh, um, about our ability to do uh, soft landing in the first place in terms of implication for monetary policy and it is also a uh, key for our understanding of the drivers of inflation and how the nominal side of the economy relates with uh, uh, measures of real activity. And uh, so in its conventional form, the New Canadian Phillips, so the conventional form uh, we refer to as the one has been popularized in the, in the Gali and Woodford textbooks. And uh, in its conventional form, the Phillips curve has inflation against uh, either output gap or unemployment gap as measures of uh, real activity, where uh, the output gap is the difference between output and the natural level, the one that arises under flexible prices. And uh, then there is the usual forward looking term and potentially cost push shocks. And uh, kappa here in the, in the first slide uh, refers to the slope of the Phillips curve, which is the key object that we are uh, interested in today. And uh, if you look at evidence from the last couple of decades, well, there is an argument for uh, saying that nothing has changed uh, from the from the Volcker era um, in, as, as well. Estimate seems to suggest that uh, uh, kappa is quite small, suggesting that there is a, a weak link between nominal side of the economy and the real side of it. Uh, so, of course, identifying kappa is well known to be a daunting uh, problem. Um, I'm just I'm just catching a few of the identification issues that have been discussed in the literature. So one of them is the endogeneity of the output gap because of the reaction function of the monetary policy. So when inflation is high and the monetary authority is slowing down um, the uh, economy and this generates uh, a negative correlation between inflation and output gap, which leads to downward bias potentially in the estimate of kappa if, if not addressed. Uh, similarly, measurement, measurement error is also potentially um, a difficulty that one needs to address to identify the slope, in particular because we do not observe the natural level of output directly. We have to resort either to proxies or, or model-based measures of it, and this, this might complicate our identification of the slope. So a third point, which is um, our starting point for the analysis of this paper, which is in between measurement and theory, is that if you take seriously the micro foundation of the new Keynesian model, under kind of weak assumptions, there is uh, um, uh, a aggregate relationship between inflation and real margin cost, which we call um, a primitive form of the uh, new Keynesian Phillips curve, which can be derived under uh, weak assumptions, if you want. Another story is the link between the real marginal cost and output gap. So if you open Galis test book uh, and you just follow through the steps, uh, this, the proportionate relationship between the marginal cost and output gap can be derived under very special circumstances. For example, in Galis textbook, one will need uh, uh, the household to be on the labor supply, so flexible wages, which we know in the data is often uh, not the case. So we start from this observation. And uh, uh, our goal is to um, try to estimate the Phillips curve, uh, which is marginal cost based. Okay, and for that, we look at quarterly panel data on prices and cost, and we see what we can learn from that. Um, we adopt a bottom up approach instead of 
first aggregating, then estimating the Phillips square, we go the other way around. So we look at firm level pricing equations. We identify structural parameters which, which are going to determine the slope of the Phillips curve from the uh, firm level evidence. And those parameters are the degree of price rigidity and the strength of strategic complementarities in price setting. So basically the market structure in a way. And with those, we are going to retrieve a slope of the Phillips curve. So the main finding that, that we have is that if you measure real activity with the real marginal cost rather than output gap or unemployment gap, the slope of the Phillips curve is going to be much larger, three to 10 times larger than a uh, common estimate using output gap. And, and we, we reconcile our finding with what uh, evidence uh, based on output gap has been um, showing by saying that there is a missing link between marginal cost, the real marginal cost, and output gap, even at the firm level. Um, so one, I'm going to discuss some advantages of using the marginal cost uh, Phillips curve over the output gap Phillips curve. And in particular, if you look at um, supply shocks, and the relevant one for the recent debate is uh, oil shocks, uh, it is much more natural to use uh, a marginal cost-based Phillips curve because uh, we do not directly observe the natural level of output, which is um, directly impacted by the shock. Okay, so I'm going to skip the literature review for interest of time. Um, so let's let's delve into the model. Uh, I'm going to be I'm going to just catch the the main uh, equations of the model and then let's see if the intuition goes through. Um, so we try to stay as general as possible within a simple framework. So the, we are assuming that there is uh, potentially a finite number of firms uh, which uh, um, operate in an imperfectly competitive environment within an industry and the phase a demand function which is uh, quite general. So the demand depends on the price die set, the price index of the industry, a vector a vector of a demand shifter and uh, the demand of the industry. Firms uh, are going to choose prices under nominal rigidity sala calvo, where theta is the probability that I'm not able to adjust prices. So if the calvo theory comes and tells you, no, you cannot adjust prices, you keep the price in, as in the previous period, and otherwise you reset the price to P0. Um, the price P0 is chosen in the standard way, so to maximize it, the present discounted um, stream of future profits, where profits are given by revenues, so the price times the demand minus some potentially general total cost function. Um, and this maximization takes into account that there is a probability that I'm not able to adjust prices in two consecutive periods. Uh, this leads to a standard looking first order condition. Uh, where, which relates the, the reset price that the firm is choosing to the nominal marginal cost and the markup. Where the markup is given by the usual learner index uh, with the elasticity of demand denoted by epsilon. So far it is pretty general. We're going to now impose a few assumptions to get to the data. So first of all, we linearize the model around the symmetric steady state. This leads to um, a first, first order condition, condition for what looking in which the price that the firm is, is setting in, in log terms is equal to the discounted present value of the markup over the nominal marginal cost. And we're going to, in the paper, we spend quite some time to show that under several models of competition, the markup in deviation from the steady state is proportional to the relative price the firm is charging. So the, the relative price is given by the difference by the reset price minus uh, this uh, P minus F, which is the price index of competitors. And this is true, for example, under monopolistic competition, but it is also true with Kimball preferences uh, in um, um, static oligopoly settings as in uh, um, Atkinson and Burstein, uh, dynamic oligopoly as in Wang and Vernon. So it's uh, pretty general. Uh, replacing the uh, markup in the first order condition, we obtain the key equation of the uh, theoretical uh, section, which is the set price uh, can be written as a function of two present values, 
One is the present value of the nominal marginal cost, and the other is the present value of the price index of competitors, and, and, and there are shocks, of, four, of course. Omega here captures the degree of strategic complementarities, and in particular, when omega is equal to one, only the price index of competitors matter. When, price, when omega is equal to zero, there are no strategic complementarities, and so only my markup, uh, my marginal cost matter. Uh, we can put together the reset price equation with the log linear price index to derive uh, the primitive form of the new Keynesian Phillips curve, which relates inflation to the real marginal cost. So here, lambda, which is the slope, is a function of three parameters. One is theta, the degree of price stickiness, beta, the discount factor, and omega, the strength of strategic complementarities. Uh, in the paper, we're going to calibrate beta to, to a standard number, 0.99 a quarterly frequency, and we're going to estimate theta and omega and, and, and pin down the slope of the Phillips curve uh, from the estimates of the structural parameters. Okay, so data. Um, so we're using Belgian data, which arguably have uh, the best data in the world if you want to estimate um, pass-through from marginal cost into prices at the firm level. So we're going to use the, the data set that they have. It's between uh, 99 and 2019 um, micro data at the quarterly frequency. So uh, this data set is very rich because we have all the information that we need to construct prices. So we have domestic sales, we have quantity, and we take domestic sales divided by quantity and we get prices, unit values. And we have almost the universe of domestic firms, but also almost the universe of foreign competitors. So it is really, so the definition of a market is really precise and it is uh, uh, really accurate to construct uh, a price index of competitors within a market. Uh, we are going to also have very detailed um, information from the tax records on total variable cost. And we're going to use total variable cost to construct a measure of marginal cost in the standard way. So we take total variable cost, we divide it by output, we get average cost, and we proxy for marginal cost using average cost. So one, one key feature of, of this data set is that, which I mentioned because we worked really hard for it, is that uh, we can track firm on average for more than 10 years. So the time series dimension within firm is very long. And this is um, extremely important for our analysis because we're going to use um, extensively time series techniques. And so uh, the time series span within a firm is uh, very important. So econometric framework. So we map directly the theory into the data in the following way. So we um, under cargo pricing, the absurd price, so the price that effectively a firm is charging, in expectation is a linear combination of the reset price and the price that the firm is uh, had yesterday, where the relative weights are given by the probability of being able to adjust. Okay. Um, so this is, this is the basis for OLS. So this is conditional expectation. We can uh, plug in to the reset price, the formula that the, that the model is giving us in terms of present value of marginal cost and uh, price index of competitors and bring directly this to the data. So the reset price, we replace it into this formula here. Uh, and, and again, uh, we express the realized price as the, a function of the present value of marginal cost as a function of the present value of the price index of competitors and in terms of the lag price. This gives a lot of robustness when we go to the data because the specification with the uh, lag price is, is, is very robust in the data. And, and you see that the coefficient in front of the lag price is theta, which identifies the, the uh, degree of price stickiness in a very general sense. So in, uh, it also accounts potentially for, for menu cost if the underlying DGP is uh, menu cost. And once we have theta, we can recover omega from the coefficient of the post through. And it is over identified because we have um, two uh, variables for uh, one parameter. Uh, 
We're going to uh, also include firm fixed effect and sector by time fixed effect. There is a long discussion in the paper for, for what are the reasons for including them. And in particular, we include sector by time fixed effect to absorb quite a bit of the variation and come from, from sectoral shocks. So basically, we are estimating parameter uh, leveraging the cross section. Um, I'm going to discuss in a second alternative specifications. Um, so we estimate, so we need to address endogeneity of the pressiness of competitors and measurement error for the marginal cost. We do that using instruments. So we are going to be uh, estimating parameters with Noli and GMM uh, with the, the moment condition that are in the slides. And so we have a bunch of robustness using different instrument, oil shocks, money shocks, and so on and so forth. But as the baseline, we start from lags. This is why uh, the time series analysis um, is, comes, comes into handy. Um, and so we choose to use lags because we want to leverage variation that comes from both supply and demand. And this is going to identify the parameters and therefore the slope of the Phillips curve, which is averages across uh, booms and busts over the cycle. Um, so we show, we spend some time in the paper to show that the instruments are valid. So when you lag, so we are, we are taking lags two years ago. So these are pretty far back in time and, um, tests of, of identifying restrictions show strongly that our instruments are valid. Uh, instruments are very powerful because at least at the firm level, marginal cost and precedence of competitors are highly correlated. So we do not run into standard weak instrument. Uh, issues that have been done in the literature for quite some time. Uh, so results. So let's start from model A, which is the one that, that I've discussed uh, in the slide. So we get as an estimate for, for theta 0.7, which is uh, more very, very close to the number the one will calibrate just using external evidence. Um, and it implies between three and four uh, quarters of stickiness. And so the, the estimate of Omega is quite high, suggesting that there is an important role for strategic complementarity and market structure, but it is in line with previous estimate by Amiti, Skoki, and Konings. So half of the variation in prices actually comes from strategic complementarity, so this is quite remarkable. Uh, model B, C, and D. So model B is the same as model A, where I replace the sector by time fixed effect with industry by time. These are narrower, these absorb entirely the price index of competitors. So we do not have to worry about endogeneity about that. And model C and D are the same as model A and B, where I'm making assumptions on the dynamics of marginal cost and price index of competitors. I'm assuming that they are A or one, and I'm estimating the parameter for this, this dynamic as well. You see that the results are consistent across all these specifications. Implications for the slope. We estimate the slope, which is quite high. It is a little bit larger than 5%. And these are on the, on the conservative side. So when we do robustness, actually we find larger numbers a little bit between six and 7%. Um, and these are substantially larger than estimates based on the output gap than the previous literature has found. Rottenberg and Woodford and, and Joe here has a very influential paper uh, with uh, a much smaller number. Um, good. So we, in the paper with the banker of bounds, I'm just going to mention it quickly. We uh, explore extensively other instruments, high frequency money, high frequency, based on high frequency money and oil shocks, like in the Gertel Karadi and Kanzig style. Uh, we explore decreasing return to scale, decreasing return to scale, and uh, pricing with menu cost, and results are robust. Aggregate implications. So. We assume that the aggregate marginal cost follows a random walk. This is consistent with the data. We show it empirically. And under this assumption, we can solve the model analytically. What does it mean? We it means that we can express inflation as a function of the real marginal cost, where this lambda tilde is, takes into account not only the slope of the Phillips curve, but also the persistence of shocks to marginal cost. What do we, uh, and the last term is a cost push shock that we're going to ignore so the difference between potential the, the, what we call what we're going to plot in the next uh, slide is data and the model it's can be interpreted as the role of cost push shocks so here goes the plot 
Okay, so black is data, red is model. The R square uh, of the regression of uh, model on data gives 50% and the correlation is 70%. So we're explaining quite a bit of the variation, half of the variation of inflation, which is kind of remarkable. If you, if, if you do the same exercise using uh, the output gap, this would be, uh, the red line would be entirely flat. So this is uh, um, interesting for me. We repeat the same exercise sector by sector. Uh, on the top left, we have uh, transportation equipment, which is the one uh, with the steepest Phillips curve. On the bottom right, we have food and beverage, which is the one with the flattest Phillips curve. You see that uh, as the Phillips curve flattens, uh, the share of inflation is explained goes down. But across the board, there is quite a general uh, positive correlation between uh, model and data. Okay, so how do we interpret uh, our results in comparison with uh, what the literature has been finding? So we try to follow the same theoretical step that one will do uh, when not able to observe real marginal cost at the aggregate level. Okay, so we take the microdata and we postulate that there is an approximate relationship that links real marginal cost to the output gap. Okay, where sigma is this uh, elasticity of marginal cost with respect to the output gap, and epsilon is uh, some approximation error, which, which possibly comes from, from wage rigidity and something that will break uh, a perfect uh, proportionality between the two variables. We assume that the, um, that the natural level of output is composed of two, of two terms. One is an industry trend, and the other one is a firm specific supply side factor, which is independence of a demand, uh, a demand shock, which is the instrument that we're gonna be using, but particular we're gonna be using money shocks. And then we go back to our main regression where we replace marginal cost with output gap, and this is what we find. Um, so we find, so first of all, when you, when you regress it with marginal cost again, now we're instrumenting with money shocks. So the slope goes a little bit high, it's a little bit, little bit higher. On the other hand, when we proxy for the marginal cost with the output gap, the slope is much smaller. So this is, uh, funnily enough, exactly the number that Rottenberg and, and, and Booth for find for the slope. And this implies uh, an elasticity between marginal cost and output, which is quite slow or quite low. It is uh, 20%, which is uh, uh, much smaller than one, what one would uh, uh, calibrate following the daily textbook. Uh, one might be worried that we are, by putting industry by quarter fixed effect, we are abstracting from general equilibrium forces. We take care of that by replacing industry by quarter with industry by three years so that we are not absorbing business cycle frequency and, and the results are, are robust. Before concluding, uh, we can use this framework to assess the effects of supply shocks. In particular, what do we do here? We run a panel uh, VR Jordan projection at the, at the firm level using as a shock, the Kanzig shock. So uh, an increase, an anticipated increase in oil prices, which is inflationary. So it increases the real marginal cost and it leads to uh, firms to push up prices. Then what we do, we take this part of the real marginal cost, we feed into our model calibrated with our slope of the Phillips curve with perfect forecast firms perfectly anticipate what happens to the real marginal cost. And this is what we get in terms of the price response when we calibrated the slope of the Phillips curve to be 6%. So we are within the 90% the confidence bands um, uh, always. To conclude, so uh, seems like if you measure the Phillips curve using marginal cost instead of output gap, the slope is larger than we thought. And, and this, this, this comes from key roles for price stickiness and a key role for the market structure, the, the strength of strategic complementarities. Um, we rationalize the difference between what we find and what the previous literature has found with a weak connection between marginal cost and output unemployment gaps. And uh, this, this can potentially come from a lot of different reasons, but one that comes to mind is wage rigidity. So in the presence of wage rigidity, the link between the two variables is not so obviously 
um, is not so obvious to be proportionate. And finally, um, this, this missing link kind of suggests that there is an interesting difference between demand and supply shocks because uh, uh, potentially in their inflationary effects because demand shocks might have um, a direct impact on the output gap, uh, whereas um, for them to affect marginal cost, it has to be uh, that to, through wage determination or through some general equilibrium feedbacks. And if the link between output gap and marginal cost is weak, then demand shocks might have a weaker inflationary effect. On the other hand, supply shocks directly enter uh, marginal cost. And so there, uh, this, this is suggesting that there might be a difference between the two. This is all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luca, for that very clear presentation. Um, let me now invite to the stage uh, Jonathan Hazel from London School of Economics, where he's Associate Professor. Um, Jonathan, you have 10 minutes. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Luca, for a great talk. Thank you for the invitation to let me present this uh, really, really interesting and well done and hopefully soon to be influential paper. Um, okay, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about the Phillips curve and in particular it's a new Keynesian uh, formalization, which as we all know relates inflation today to inflation expectations in the future, the current output gap or some other measure of slack or aggregate demand and supply shocks. And really there are two objects of interest that we're looking to study here. The first is what people call the slope of the Phillips curve, where here I've labeled kappa how much was a fall in unemployment, an increase in the output gap, a sort of increase in the tightness of the economy, how much does that raise inflation? And the second thing is the expectations coefficient beta. How forward-looking is inflation? How much does inflation today react to inflation expectations in the future? What did we know before this important paper by Luca and company? Uh, there was a growing consensus, uh, at least before the COVID pandemic, about the slope coefficient kappa. A growing consensus that it was relatively flat, at least in the US data, but also around the world. That was captured very well in a paper by Stock and Watson and also in some earlier work that I have with Juan, Emmy, and John. Perhaps this has changed after the pandemic, as, as Goji showed recently. Um, but at least before the pandemic, there was an emerging consensus that the slope of the Phillips curve was relatively low. What there was much less consensus about is this expectations coefficient, which I called beta. No consensus at all, really. I think looking back over past work, one can make a good case for beta being zero, beta being one, beta being something in between. Um, to quote from an influential paper about 10 years ago by Mavridis, Pagbo, Muller, and Stock, whose conclusions I think still resound today, they said, quote, the identification of the new Keynesian Phillips curve is too weak. We think it will be more fruitful to explore fundamentally new sources of identification, such as micro or sexual data. And the fundamental issue with estimating beta that I'll touch upon later in my discussion is weak instruments in the time series. I'm emphasizing this because as much as we've talked about the slope of the Phillips curve today, obviously very important, I think of sort of the quote, holy grail of Phillips curve estimation is looking at this coefficient term beta, how forward looking are inflation expectations. Obviously, this is the thing that animated how we think about the Phillips curve going all the way back to Phelps and Friedman and this, this earlier debate between the, the classic thing of Samuelson and Solo versus its more, its more modern incarnation, even going back to the 1960s. This paper, so Luca and company ask, what can we learn about the aggregate Phillips curve from microdata? And the answer is a tremendous amount. So before I get into my comments, I'm going to unpack exactly what this tremendous amount is, how they're able to do it. And then I'll talk about three things. I'll, I'll say sort of in encouragement to these authors in current and perhaps future work that this is a very powerful, um, powerful machinery to also estimate this coefficient beta, which I think is very important. And hopefully you do, too. I'll talk a little bit about how to think about identification. And I'll talk about some alternative models that might be out there that are also very sensitive that I hope the authors can do more to disentangle from the model that we have right now. Okay, so that approach, there's a theory piece, which Luca already mentioned, so I'll go through briefly. They write down the standard new Keynesian model, the Calvo model, with strategic complementarity and price setting. The firm price today, PFT, is related to sort of an outer product, which contains the Calvo parameter, the degree of price stickiness theta, as well as um, some terms relating to the discount factor of the firm beta. Then there's an expected present value term. That's the expected present value of the marginal costs of the firm. 
that's pre-multiplied by a term omega, which reflects strategic complementarities to what extent firms are setting prices in response to how other firms are setting prices. There's a final term, theta PF T minus one. That's lag prices. That's how much prices today respond to prices in the past. In their model, that's going to map directly onto the degree of price stickiness for sort of obvious reasons, which is that if you can't adjust your price today, PFT, then it's going to be the same as your price yesterday, PFT minus one. One thing I also want to emphasize is this interpretation of this final term epsilon FT, which is much like a sort of regression residual. You should think about this as all of the other factors that can affect prices other than marginal costs, other firms' prices, and expectations about those things in the future. The main interpretation that I think one should bear in mind, other than perhaps expectation errors, is what I think of as idiosyncratic demand shocks. So holding fixed firms' marginal costs, why would their prices rise today? Because there's an idiosyncratic increase in the demand for the product of that firm. That's the natural way to think about it. The authors show that this microequation implies a standard aggregate Phillips curve, and that means that one can estimate the Phillips curve using parameters from microdata. So that's the key sort of theoretical innovation of the paper, the key insight. They also show that this holds very generally. So for most of the models that we write down, even with menu costs, even with strategic complementarity, models that I, at least before reading this paper, thought were very rich, perhaps too rich to be analytically tractable, the authors show that there's going to still be a similar sort of micro to macro mapping. So that's the theory side. On the measurement, they're going to estimate the equation that I just showed you by the generalized method of moments, they're going to use Belgian data. Belgian data is very good for the task at hand because it's essentially comprehensive. As Lucas said, you can see prices, you can see competitors' prices, you can see marginal costs, you can see everything that you need to see. They're going to calibrate beta. They're going to estimate, remember that's the forward-looking parameter on inflation expectations. They're going to estimate theta, the degree of price stickiness. And in particular, they're going to use instruments. So the instrument for marginal costs is the eight-year lag of marginal costs. The identification assumption is that this is orthogonal to the current sort of regression residual, to current things such as idiosyncratic firm level demand shocks. Their main results, I'll go through this quickly before my comments, is that lambda is relatively high. The slope of the Phillips curve with respect to marginal cost is relatively high, but additional evidence suggests that kappa is relatively low. So the slope, of the uh, the slope with respect to marginal cost is relatively high. The slope with respect to the output gap is relatively low. And that's because a parameter that at the bottom of the slide I've called phi is relatively low, the mapping between output and marginal costs. OK, so some quick implications is that this is going to be important discipline for future models. It matters a lot for the propagation of supply versus demand shocks. But I want to get onto my comments. And my first main comment that I want you to take away from this is that this is a great paper. It's an important question, interesting results, general and tractable model, painstaking empirical work. So I think it's going to be highly influential, and that's the one thing that I, I really want you to bear in mind from my discussion. Um, but I want to make three comments. And the first is perhaps not for this paper, which is already um, packed to the brim, but for these authors in future work, or for other authors, is that I think this is a great framework to estimate beta. And remember, again, beta is how forward-looking inflation expectations is. I gave you this motivating point at the start, where I said, you know, we, we have rel relatively little information about this most important of parameters for thinking about inflation. Why not? Because we've got this weak instruments issue in the time series. And then 10 years ago, other people were saying, well, maybe we can go to the microdata. Maybe we can get much more variation with which to estimate beta. These authors have precisely that very rich variation. However, for now, they calibrate beta. So in their empirical exercise, they pick a value beta equal to 0 0.99. That seems very reasonable. It's what I've done, what others have done in past work. But I don't think that's necessarily the, the, the final point for empirical work here. In particular, I hope that in future work, they or others can estimate beta. Now, of course, one issue is perhaps beta and theta. Theta, remember again, is this sort of price stickiness parameter, might potentially be poorly identified from, from each other. But we already have lots of evidence on theta. We already have lots of evidence on the slope of the Phillips curve, which is related to theta. We have lots of evidence on the frequency of price change, including some sort of assembled by authors. And so I, I like to think that because we already know quite a bit about the slope of the Phillips curve, but relatively little about how forward-looking inflation is, I hope this is a machinery that can be put to work to estimate that latter thing. Like I said, there's no consensus on the value of beta, how forward-looking inflation is. Uh, I think of this as, as one of the holy grails of Phillips curve estimation, and the sort of, in the room, to, to, to sort of the more policy-minded, of course, as we had in the excellent speech at the beginning, there's a, it's important to think about the slope of the Phillips curve, but it's also important to think about how forward-looking this is going to be, how much inflation expectations management is going to matter for inflation today. My second comment is about identification. So coming back to the main estimating equation, 
think of this sort of heuristically as a regression. Think about epsilon, that regression residual, as picking up the other factors affecting prices. For instance, idiosyncratic firm demand shocks. So again, holding fixed marginal costs, why your prices move around? Because the demand of the firm is moving up and down. The identification assumption of the authors is that lagged marginal costs, as well as lagged prices, are orthogonal to firm level demand shocks. And I'm not sure whether, this, whether or not this is plausible. I don't really have a prior in this. I think one can tell stories where this isn't plausible. If you imagine very persistent firm level demand shocks, you know I'm a manufacturer, people over the course of five or 10 years really start to want my goods more and more and more. My prices rise today, my prices rise in two years time or five years time, so do my marginal costs. This is obviously gonna be a big threat to the validity of the instruments. This is something that I think the authors could help us understand better. And perhaps they could pursue alternative instruments in order to sort of fortify and enhance what they're doing. The two instruments that I came up with, um, but I'm sure they can come up with others, is firstly something using the foreign components of marginal costs. So there's a famous influential paper by Amity, Iskoki, and Konings that have done that. Or perhaps some kind of shift share instrument. So there's some exercises with all shocks that go in this direction. Perhaps the authors could do more of this. The point about some kind of shift share instrument is one could plausibly build the case that these are, these are things that are orthogonal to the sort of idiosyncratic component of firm level demand shocks that plausibly is very important and perhaps some kind of confounding variation for what they're doing. So I think I have one minute left or, or perhaps that, okay, one minute. So the final thing I'll say is, well, we have this model um, by Lucre and co-authors. Heuristically in this model, regressing current prices on lag prices is going to identify uh, nominal rigidity. Um, but perhaps poking fun at one of the co-authors who are not here, there's an extremely influential paper by Mark Gertler and Jordi Galli, who suggested a different model, a model of inflation with backward-looking price setters in which sort of past inflation has some effect in current inflation today. And so others in the audience, including Ricardo, have, have developed similar models um, with some similar or, or not so similar models, but with some similar time series properties. Of course, this model is going to have very different um, aggregate dynamics. For instance, the sacrifice ratio is going to be much bigger because it's backward looking. Now, if the sort of galley gartler 99 model is true, regressing current prices on lag prices is going to have a very different interpretation. It's not just going to be price stickiness, but it's also going to be something to do with how backward looking inflation is. And so in that case, the estimates, the interpretation of, of the authors mapping between the model and the data is going to be somewhat different from what they have. And so, you know, I'm hoping the authors to nudge the authors slightly towards considering that alternative model, um, which is obviously at the top of um, Mark Gutler's mind, at least one, and, and ruling it out in favor of their current model, which is quite a different model. It has different interpretations, different policy implications too. So with that, let me wrap up. The main thing is to say that this is a great paper because of its general and tractable modeling, its careful empirical work, its important results. Um, in terms of comments, I'd like to see more work done to estimate beta in this and other papers, useful to know more about identification, and to think about some alternative models that might fit the data too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Great, great discussion and great suggestions, I think, there. Um, Maybe I can just see if there's any questions, any burning questions in the room or online. Frank, yes, yeah, please. So the question is whether, whether how, how much gross uh, firm variation there is in, in sort of degrees of price stickiness and uh, complementarity also across sectors. Luca, maybe as we're at time, I'll give you five minutes to respond to Frank's question, the discussion. Okay, thank you. So um, across sectors, there is a lot of variation. Uh, in fact, the slope of the Phillips curve for the transportation, uh, and the, uh, which is the, the steepest one, is like 0.3. Uh, and for tobacco, food and beverages is like uh, 0 0.03. So uh, there is quite a lot of variation between the two. And this comes and like in depending on the sector, it comes from either um, different degrees of stickiness or different degrees of um, complementarities. Uh, so there is a lot of variation in both. Um, so regarding uh, Joe comments, thank you for the discussion. It was uh, uh, very useful and very insightful. Um, so definitely the, the comment on beta, we're going to work on that. Um, I've been um, exploring that a little bit. I remember finding numbers in the neighborhood of one, uh, but then we didn't go in that direction. So, so maybe in future work, we're going to think about that. 
uh, for inflation inertia and uh, and stickiness. So the the paper by Mark with Gali. Um, so uh, from Mark's perspective, not having the lag was a great advantage of this setup. So in, in Mark's eyes, it was like, we don't need the lag to explain quite a bit of inflation. And this is a great advantage of, of the framework that we have here. Uh, potentially, if we include also the lag, uh, we're going to improve on the feet of the model versus data. So the, the black line versus the red line, because uh, inflation is quite persistent. So including the lag might play in our favor. Um, but we didn't want, we, we wanted to show that without having the, the lag, we still could uh, do a good job at explaining 50% of the variation in inflation. Um, but uh, it would be useful definitely to use this framework to try to disentangle of whether we do need or not uh, such a lag. And uh, regarding the identification, uh, so we've been thinking about that for a, for a long time. Um, so basically, uh, if shocks, even at the firm level, demand or supply doesn't really matter, are not correlated over time or are correlated over time, but they kind of disappear before a couple of years. Uh, then everything that we've done here uh, goes through without any, any any problem. The type of uh, firm level shocks that that might create issues are those that are correlated over time, uh, but are not are at the firm level. Are correlated over time, are highly persistent, but are not absorbed by neither the firm fix effect. So, for example, firm quality would be absorbed in, into the firm fix effects because it's permanent. Um, or approximately permanent um, and is not absorbed into the industry by time fixed effect. So it doesn't have uh, an industry component to it. So they really have to be firm specific shocks, which are not permanent and are highly correlated over time. Um, in a way, uh, we do uh, shift share instruments in the robust sections because the, the oil and money shock that we construct um, have a uh, firm specific exposure so they can be interpreted as a uh, shift share in a way so they kind of attenuate this type of concerns um, and uh, we also try to use uh, the amity skoki conings uh, type of instrument uh, with uh, uh, exchange rate shocks but unfortunately it's not powerful at uh, quarterly frequency so they have yearly frequency we look at quarterly frequency and it, it seems not to work um, so yeah, this is, uh, thanks for the discussion and thanks for the question. That's great, thank you very much, Luca. So that brings us to the end of our first session. Um, so I'd just like to thank very much all of the panel members and discussions. I think there was a really great start and also to thank again our executive board member, Isabel Schnabel for being with us and for her great comments. So we'll start back again at 12 uh, sharp so we have a short break now for just over 15 minutes uh, and we'll start back with the keynote address by Ricardo Reich. So thank you to everyone in the room and also to those online and see you back at 12.